There are now 43 states on New York's mandatory quarantine list. Movie theaters are reopening, and Nexium leader Keith Raniere will be sentenced next week. There's a lot to unpack in this week's headlines. On this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the week's top stories. If I were Keith Raniere, I would not be making plans any time for the next um, decade plus, without a doubt. We'll talk about the Times Union editorial board's endorsement of a candidate for president. To treat Trump as the kind of candidate, let's say, that John McCain was or Mitt Romney was, is to elevate his chaos. And we'll learn what happened to a painting stolen by the Nazis in the 1930s that ended up in Kanija Harry. The Mazza family lost nearly everything because they were Jews, but they did not lose hope. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. Let's start with a look at what appeared in the Times Union and on timesunion.com this week. We are here with Times Union editor Casey Seiler, as always, to go over the top headlines that came from the week. We'll start right in with COVID-19. Governor Cuomo expanded the list of mandatory quarantine states, but then he turned around and said, why do we do we even need this quarantine state thing? Can you give us the latest on, on what's going on there at the at the Cuomo level? The requirement that people need to quarantine if they enter New York from a specific set of states is based on the idea that if those states are experiencing COVID infections up to a certain set of metrics, it would be best if those visiting from those states were on lockdown for two weeks to, of course, prevent them from being out and about in our great state and spreading the virus. Now, the problem is when there is, well, there are a lot of problems, but this one specifically is when there is an uptick in cases on states that border New York, where, of course, there are so many connections, such as, for example, people who live in Connecticut, which is one of the states we're talking about, or New Jersey, who work in Manhattan or wherever, it is, of course, a lot more difficult for those people to, near impossible for those people to meet the quarantine restrictions. So in terms of those two states and uh, in terms of Pennsylvania, where numbers are inching up again, the governor basically said, look, we're going to make these uh, quarantine restrictions advisory for essential workers and for people who need to, to go back and forth between the states So it is changing the rules somewhat, while at the same time adding states to the pre-existing list that you will have to quarantine if if you come to New York from. Maryland, for example, which is only essentially two states away or one state away, you know, Pennsylvania in the middle from New York, is now on that list. So anybody traveling from Baltimore who comes to New York who is not an essential worker has to get tested and then be on lockdown for for 2 weeks. I myself went to Kentucky, which has been a hot spot state for more than 2 months for my mother's 80th birthday. Had a great time, but of course when I got back, I got tested and I was on a pretty serious lockdown for 2 weeks. Perhaps the biggest headline of the week, uh, or I guess the month, Keith Raniere's sentencing. It's happening next week. You and Rob did an episode of Nexium on Trial, which is our sister podcast that kind of previews what we are going to see next week. But maybe you can give us another little preview. Yeah, Rob Gavin, our our outstanding cops and courts reporter, is going to be in the federal courtroom in Brooklyn on Tuesday when Keith Ranieri will be sentenced, the co-founder of Nexium, the man known within the organization as Vanguard, who was at the top of the notorious master slave. 
organization, club, group, conspiracy, whatever you want to call it, within Nexium faces the prospect of uh, life in prison. He was, of course, convicted on all charges in June of 2019. It's going to be an emotional and long session. Uh, Raniere's victims, uh, many of them will be appearing, giving victim impact statements before the federal judge hands down his sentence. If I were Keith Ranieri, I would not be making plans anytime for the next um, decade plus, without a doubt. We are going to bring you a short segment from a Nexium on Trial taping that we had done. And Casey, we'll go right to that. But thank you so much for joining us. And we'll check back in with you next week. Thanks, Jess. Let's talk about a story that you're telling, a story that will be going up online on timesunion.com on Friday and in print in Sunday's edition. And that concerns the reasons why when Keith Ranieri did face federal prosecutors, it was not in the capital region where so many of the crimes that he was convicted of were committed, but rather three hours plus south in Brooklyn. And it speaks specifically, you talk to a number of Nexium's victims about their interactions with officials in the capital region, some of them at the local, state, and even federal level, and why all down the line, it appears, they were rebuffed in their efforts to get some official help in bringing Ranieri to justice. We've known for a long time that there was never a real effort in the capital region among law enforcement to go after Nexium, which as far back as 2003 was reported on by the Times Union. In 2012, you know, we did this huge series, uh, Jim Adato and Jennifer Gish. There had been a lot of reporting out there, a lot of allegations and no criminal cases. What happened in 2017, of course, was Nexium and DOS get revealed. But it could have been revealed a lot earlier, we now find out. I spoke to Sarah Edmondson, who people may know from The Vow, and obviously she was the whistleblower on DOS. She gave the interview with the New York Times in October 2017. So I spoke to Sarah Edmondson, and she told me that on May 30th, 2017, this is before any of this stuff came out, she personally visited the Albany office of the FBI, met with an agent, and explained that DOS existed, that she had been uh, branded, that other women had been branded, and in fact mentioned that she knew there was going to be more brandings, and she told me she gave them addresses, told them who to call, who was involved, and told this to an FBI agent who in turn told her that it sounded a little messed up, that it was happening, but that it didn't sound illegal and appeared to be consensual. And Sarah Edmondson never heard back from that agent. You know, she was expecting a raid, according to what she told me. She thought they were going to go right in and raid the place. And she was just sort of shocked that that, that nothing happened. And uh, I also spoke to Sarah's attorney, Neil uh, Glazer, who is the attorney in a civil suit where he represents many victims of Nexium against Keith Ranieri and Nexium, also filed in Brooklyn. You know, he told me that he was befuddled, that's the word he used, befuddled by the inaction in the Northern District of New York is what he said, that this woman walked into her office and he said that they made her feel ashamed and that they judged Sarah Edmondson and that's just excusable, I'm sorry, inexcusable to him. Not only was there a lack of law enforcement going after Nexium, but people who were whistleblowers on Nexium found themselves facing the uh, law. And, and I spoke to a number of former uh, members of Nexium who, to a large degree, you get many of the same answers. Why? Why did this happen? And they will talk about how much money was poured into, in their view, the political arena and other things. I want to talk specifically about one of those um, folks, and that's Barbara Boucher, who was a successful financial planner, a, a, a successful businesswoman who was drawn into Nexium, became, I think it's fair to say, sort of a member of its senior leadership team, and then broke with the organization 
found herself and her professional existence threatened by Nexium's litigation machine and fought back, fought back not only against, um, you know, their civil assault, but also the potential that she could face criminal charges. I'm the elephant in the room that he can't explain away, excuse away, and say, well, she did this, she lied here, because I did not. Yes, uh, within 18 hours of leaving Nexium, Barbara Boucher was served with civil and criminal actions for what they viewed as alleged extortion. She had told uh, uh, Ranieri that she had money owed to her and wanted that money back, and they tried to use that as an extortion case. This is a recurring theme with Nexium, where people try to leave them, and then Nexium would use their powers that they had, their influence. They would certainly try to get authorities to bring criminal charges against those people who had left. Barbara Boucher said she went to a number of different agencies, including the Attorney General's office, the State Tax Department, federal investigators, and that at one point, this just took a very long time. At times, they appear, at times, there looked like there would be an investigation. When she first was threatened with that extortion case, she said she talked to an attorney uh, who then quickly called up federal prosecutors in Albany and was told that, oh, well, you know, there's already a case being built against those, against those people. So that's something that I wouldn't worry about, so to speak. But nothing happened. And as years go by, Barbara said that she continues to have hope and meet with agencies and think that something's going to happen. And at some point, she meets with the Charities Bureau of the Attorney General's office. I worked with them for several months and with the chief bureau agent um, of the Crimes Division of Charities Fraud. And then after three months, I kid you not, this is what he said to me. Barb, it is clear that there's corruption here. However... We have bigger fish to fry. Uh, that's what she said. She was told by the AG's office. I, I'm waiting for a response from the AG's office on that. Uh, uh, they, they did get back to me, but I don't know what their take is going to be officially on that. Uh, the same way I'm waiting for a response from the FBI, and I'm sure they'll have one, about why was Sarah Edmondson's complaint not taken seriously. What else did Barbara Boucher say? Well, Barbara Boucher was really concerned about the fact that this was something that, in her view, this was a, a long time coming. And this had taken 11 years. It was really a story of frustration. And she talked about Keith Raniere and her, her relationship with Keith Raniere and what that was like. When I asked her, you know, what, what this was like, she essentially said that Keith Raniere was not playing with a full deck, in her view, and that she realized that this was someone who does the things he does because he's, he's not all there in her view. You know, he's a delusional, sick man. And that's what it all comes down to. And I've always predicted that he will go down in history like another one of the Charles Manson and Jim Jones in the Waco, Texas, because people can't wrap their heads around it. Barbara Boucher certainly, you know, makes very you know, repeated notice of the fact that she is a Troy native. She's a hometown girl, as she puts it. She's from Troy. She had made some success of herself as a financial planner. And then Nexium and Ranieri's vindictiveness caused her to move across the country. It's really a, a sad story that, that ultimately she was able to triumph over because, you know, obviously Ranieri's going to prison and Barbara Boucher is going to be delivering a victim impact statement. You can hear more about the latest in the ongoing Nexium saga in our sister podcast, Nexium on Trial. Visit timesunion.com or find it wherever you listen to podcasts. And now on to a topic that's likely on the minds of most Americans, the upcoming presidential election. The Times Union editorial board has endorsed candidates for president for decades. They've been candidates from different parties and for many different reasons. They made their endorsement for this year's presidential election this week, and I talked to editorial page editor Jay Jocknowitz about it. Let's talk about the editorial board's endorsement of former Vice President Joe Biden. I'm guessing, you know, by the tenor of the editorial itself, uh, that there wasn't really much debate as to who the board was going to go with, right? No, I think if you read our editorials for the last four years, um, or more, actually, uh, going back to his candidacy, that we have never really agreed with the idea that this, this man was capable of being president. And, and you know, he's 
borne that out um, at every turn in our view. So um, no, this was the question was how we were going to do it. If you look at the latter half of the editorial, structurally it's done in a certain way. The latter half of the editorial gets into four general issues with Trump, uh, that he's corrupt, he's incompetent, he's um, cruel, and he is divisive. And originally, when I conceived this back in July, <laughs> we were, I, I, July or August, I, I said to the editorial board, you know, we might consider, I think somebody else had mentioned it, the idea of a four-part editorial, that we actually do it over four Sundays. You know, that was one option. But in the end, I felt we could contain it in one editorial. Obviously, you mentioned the differences, kind of the structural differences, where you laid it out in the paper, you know, versus in previous presidential elections. What else about this was so different? Was this like the first time you've ever had to write anything like this, you know, regarding a major election? This was different because it was not, <laughs> this is going to sound, well, it's not going to sound any, any worse than the, the editorial, I guess. Uh, Trump is, when you look at him, his, he is not a serious person when it comes to these things. So to treat Trump as the kind of candidate, let's say, that John McCain was or Mitt Romney was, is to elevate his chaos to the idea of, a con of concepts. And um, they're not. He, he speaks in platitudes and um, grand plans that he may or may not believe are true. If we were to sum up his immigration policy, it would build a wall. You know, I mean, he's not going to design a box for that and have a serious discussion of one candidate's position and then say Trump wants to build a wall <laughs> you know, and, and arrest people and put children in cages. So that, that part of the concept um, didn't need to happen. It was the biggest editorial, longest editorial I have ever written. Um, it, is, it may well be the longest editorial we've ever written. I'm going to say we did not write anything that long in the 40s, 30s, 20s. I've seen some of those papers um, because we sometimes look back on a holiday weekend or something or a holiday when we're kind of time crunched. And we'll go back and we'll do a retro editorial. We'll take something that is timely in the sense that it echoes what's going on now as a current event. But in the middle of the recession, for example, we looked at what, what, was, what kind of editorial did the Times Union write you know, in the Depression, something like that. And we'd say, you know, let's do that one. Let's give readers kind of a historical treat. When I look at those, they're very short. They tend to be very short. They're, they were also rambling. It was like some opinion writer just sat down and kind of emptied a notebook <laughs> or something or had random, it was like Jack Handy's random thoughts. I don't know. It was weird. So I never <laughs> seen By Jack Handy. <laughs> I love those. No, obviously you did not interview Trump or Biden, right? No. I will tell you that back in the 2008, we invited them both in. McCain's people wanted to put an op-ed in the paper. And I said, well, you know, actually, we tend not to use op-eds from candidates, um, you know, this close to an election. But, you know, as long as I have you on the phone, <laughs> if you'd like to get Mr. McCain to come in, we haven't done an endorsement yet, and we would like them. And they were like, oh, well, you know, we'll see if we can arrange the schedule. And it's like, yeah. That was like my in asking for an interview with Sophia Loren once. You already talked about the feedback a little bit. You, you know, you, you saw some positive feedback from this, this endorsement. Is there any other feedback? Has there been kind of more feedback than normal? What is your sense of that so far? I've, I've gotten just nice notes for a change. I have not gotten anything nasty from anybody, which is unusual. The, the only other place I heard comments was, um, you know, I kind of scooted around um, some of the local talk shows just to see if anybody said anything. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of time to listen, so I only caught a few minutes. And I only heard, I heard one woman, you know, who was not happy with it, but she didn't give any reasons. You know, that's the thing. It's just, you know, she just called it a disgusting editorial and, and that was it. But she didn't give me any, you know, you know any, any counter argument. And I think it's just, you know, you kind of either, I think there are people that feel you either, you either love him or you don't. And if you don't, we don't really need to hear your reasons for it. <laughs> well, then don't read the editorial, I guess. I don't know what to tell you. Are there any other races that you're going to yeah. endorse that you didn't talk about before? 
Uh, we are going to endorse in legislative races and in congressional races, and we're going to in, um, make a recommendation in the um, Saratoga Charter issue. After the break, a painting stolen by Nazis in pre-World War II Germany is discovered in Kanajahari, New York. Hi, I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union. Join us for an ongoing discussion on major developments in the saga of Keith Raniere, co-founder of Nexium, the shadowy upstate New York organization at the center of the explosive federal investigation that resulted in his conviction on charges of extortion, sex trafficking, and more. We talk to former members of Nexium, discuss the latest news, and preview the likely next twists in this bizarre and disturbing story. You can find Nexium on trial at timesunion.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. In 1933, the Nazis stole paintings from the art collection of a Jewish newspaper publisher named Rudolf Massa. Almost 90 years later, the FBI in Albany returned one of those paintings to Massa's heirs. Reporter Eduardo Medina wrote about the exchange, which took place at the Arkell Museum in Canajahari last week. 87 and a half years ago, this painting in front of you painted in the late 19th century by Melcher, was expropriated from the Berlin-based Massa family. So the painting is of a woman in a red hood with a man to her left. And the background is this muted, kind of snowy background. And from what I understand, they're actually going to go skate. Ostensibly, you know, the Nazis confiscated this painting and... World War II progressed and happened, and we all know what happened there. And then somehow it made its way to Kanajahari, to the Arkell Museum. Is that right? Yeah. So an American artist painted it. The original buyer of the painting was this guy named Rudolf uh, Massa. And Rudolf Massa was this German philanthropist who was uh, obviously very wealthy. And he collected art. He had a bunch of art from around the world. And so he purchased this painting. You know, it, it was just part of his collection. So cut to uh, 1920, you know, he, 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 he passes away and, and his daughter, Felicia Lachman, I believe, I know for a fact I'm butchering the name, so my apologies to the Massa family <laughs> and to listeners. But his daughter uh, inherited, you know, his, uh, his company, his publishing company, and, and also inherited his, uh, his art collection. And so when she inherited this, she also got this paper called the Berliner uh, Tajblatt. And the Berliner Tajblatt was this like, was the main paper in Germany. And they were very critical against the Nazi party when the Nazi party was rising to power. That was around 1933. And so Massa's daughter, uh, Felicia, is, is, is uh, carrying on the, the family's legacy of, of, of publishing periodicals. And this one happens to be critical of the Nazi party. And of course, the Nazi party was not a fan of that. Felicia and her husband were, were persecuted and they had to flee Germany in 1933. And the Nazis subsequently seized the, the family's assets, including uh, all of their artwork. And one of those pieces of art was the one that we saw this week. It's called Winter. And so that's the one that the FBI found and was giving it back to the Massa organization. So and then somehow it ended up crossing the ocean and in... Kanajahari in the Arkell Museum. The, the the story of how it got to Kanajahari is kind of a uh, kind of complicated, but I'll, I mean I'll try to lay it down in a straightforward way. So basically, an unknown purchaser bought the painting uh, from an auction house in May of 1934, and we know that five months later the piece ended up at the Macbeth Art Gallery in New York City. Uh, you know, obviously when it ended up at the gallery in New York City, the Massa family was in no way compensated for their art that was stolen. And, and obviously the, the Macbeth Art Gallery had no idea that it was stolen. And so in 1934, uh, Bartlett Arkell, he was the, uh, the first president of this company called the Beechnut Packing Company. 
And so he, you know, this guy Arkel had a bunch of art from around the world, very wealthy guy, and he wanted to buy this piece called Winter. And so he, he bought it and he added it to what would eventually become uh, his museum, a well, museum named after him, the Arkel Museum. And as we know, that is located in Kanajahari. And so that is the way Winter, this stolen art piece, or this piece that the Nazis stole, uh, ended up here in, uh, in New York. Like, why now? Why all of a sudden, you know, in 2020, 76 years later, hold on, I had to pause and do the math there. Why, why 76 years later is it, you know, suddenly being given back? Yeah, that's a good question. I, so what happened was the Mossa Foundation, it's a foundation that's all about uh, art and, and education. They know that a lot of these art pieces were stolen and, and they're located all across the world and in several galleries. And so they're in the process of trying to get these pieces back. It was determined that that winter was was one of the pieces that uh, Rudolf Massa originally bought back in back in uh, in Germany way back when, and so as soon as the the Arkham Museum found out, they were quick to give it back to to the Massa Foundation, and there was no you know fight over it or litigation. The evidence was there, and uh, through the help of the FBI, they quickly realized that. It, it was the right thing to give winter back to its rightful owners. The Maza family lost nearly everything because they were Jews, but they did not lose hope. Wow. And so you watched the, I don't know, was it a ceremony or the, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. You watched the press conference where the painting was given back, right? Right. Yes, I did. It was uh, held virtually. You know, in the center was, was a podium where the FBI officials spoke to the left, you know, if you're watching the, the, the actual ceremony, was the, the painting was Winter. And to the right was uh, Roger Strouch. And Roger Strouch is the step-great-grandson of uh, Rudolf Massa. And he now leads the, the Massa Foundation for Education and the Arts. Were they grateful to, to get the painting back finally after all these years? Yeah, they really were. They, a lot of his, um, his speech was about actually outlining the, the history of, of the family and how the art was actually stolen. Goebbels and Goring themselves were intimately involved in orchestrating the looting and monetizing of this family's assets. It was one of the first large expropriations undertaken by the Nazis, a template for what became unfortunately, a well-oiled machine. And so he talked about that for several minutes. And towards the end of his, his, his speech, he was really grateful to all the officials who helped out in, in locating the, the artwork. And he was also really grateful to the, the Arkham Museum for being so willing to, to quickly give it back. I'd like to take a moment to offer some sincere thanks to the people who made this day possible after all these years. That's like a fascinating story. It feels like it's like some, it's like the plot of a movie, right? In fact, I think that was the plot of a movie. So, it, you know, it makes it really interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm sure it is. And uh, it was fascinating to, to, to cover it. And uh, I think it was a nice story to write about because it, it justice was, was served and it was a, uh, insightful to learn about the history and, and how the Nazis, you know, engaged in this horrific uh, systemic looting. Indeed. And you can see this beautiful painting at timesunion.com on your article, right? For sure. Yeah, of course. That's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram or head over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features.